Thank you. Good to see you. A lot happening, especially during COVID-19, Steve. Talking about retrenchment, many people have lost jobs. Some people feel the retrenchment process has been unfair. So the question is, Steve, as we begin, is there responsible retrenchment? Uh, I think as you've put it correctly, there's a lot that is happening. Unfortunately, we're in the middle of um, a very serious uh, crisis, uh, which happened to have come in, in the middle of um, an, e an economy that was actually struggling to survive. So one would ask what is responsible uh, retrenchment because at the end of the day, businesses are trying to survive. At the end of the day, a uh, few people will understand what it means to run a business. And uh, running a small kiosk whereby the, the owner is the only employee and running a, a hotel chain where you have 3,000 employees is actually very different. So the need for responsible uh, retrenchment would mean whereby all parties are involved. We're looking at the Ministry of Labor, we're looking at um, COTU, the representatives of workers, we're looking at uh, the employees themselves, we're looking at the, the legal fraternity. So this is the only way to actually have something that will be re re responsible. But unfortunately, given the, the state of affairs, whereby we've been working from home or sitting at home for the last uh, three months, it's quite unfortunate because um, by the time we actually recover, uh, we'll be looking at, um, because I mean, this country is actually run on an informal sector where 88% of the jobs come from. And uh, given what's been happening and given what's been reported, I think uh, there's a lot of data that's actually missing mm -hmm. so that we can be able to make an informed uh, decision on what responsible retrenchment is. But for me, I think everyone is just simply trying to survive. Owners of the businesses are trying to survive. And we need to understand that at the end of the day, uh, the, the reason why one has a business is to make profits. So when the business is not making profits and you're digging into your own pocket to survive, then the only responsible thing is to shut it down. So when, when, when the question of what is responsible actually uh, is being asked, then the issue of uh, what is our government doing, the issue for access to credit, the issue of all the relevant stakeholders who actually manage a particular sector needs mm -hmm. to actually be looked into from a wider perspective. And Steve... You are a research analyst and I know you've come across data, you've mentioned some of that data is, is not sufficient because we still don't know uh, the actual status as far as people working in informal, uh, the informal sector. But for the much knowledge that you have as it is right now, um, and you've mentioned that all parties must be involved as far as retrenchment is concerned, would you say this has been the case for many of the Kenyans who have lost their jobs? Unfortunately, uh, it's not been the case. Um, I've not seen Kotu um, actually taking a firm stand against what's been happening. I've not seen the Federation of Kenyan Employers actually coming together and saying, um, uh, trying to outline the framework on, 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 on what's happening and what has been done to be able to seek support from uh, relevant uh, government agencies before any retrenchment is done. All we've seen is um, a couple of hotels announcing publicly that they've retrenched, they've fired permanently their workers. There's been uh, an outcry on social media platforms. And then two days later, we see the president pledging a, a, cup, uh, you know, a couple of billions support for, for that particular sector. But uh, you see, um, a lot of sectors are suffering. We're looking at manufacturing, we're looking at construction, we're looking at agriculture, we're looking at agro-processing, we're looking at the service sector, we're looking at, at logistics. Especially logistics has really suffered a lot because we're seeing a lot of ch policy changes that's affecting the, 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 the transport sector. And no one is actually coming to the aid of the, the workers there. And unfortunately, uh, I would expect Kotu to be at the forefront in terms of fighting for the rights of workers. But we seem to see that um, our attention seem, seems to be focusing on politics. And um, the biggest challenge that I've seen many SMEs and many employers facing is a lack of access to credit, meaning that they're not able to finance their businesses. And ultimately, this means that most of them have to shut down. And because there's no proper coordination with the relevant stakeholders. We've seen um, Kenya Association of Manufacturers, we've seen KEPS are trying to issue a couple of statements, but they've not really gone a step further and brought all the stakeholders on the table and seen what is the way forward. Because I would expect uh, a forum that's actually led by CAM, CAPSA, uh, KEPSA, sorry, uh, KOTU, uh, FKE, to try and see how best they can be able to work with the commercial sector, the banking, the financial services sector, to try and see how best it will be to uh, seek uh, a fund that can actually be able to be used to secure a guarantee for the SME sector so that 
those people with at least say five plus employees can be able to get access to credit and be able to survive because uh, full data will actually be available at the end of uh, June at the, 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 the end of uh, June, July, then you can be able to tell the, the extent to the damage that the, the economy has actually felt. Uh, Steve, we'll come back to the SMEs, but I think it's good for to help our audience understand. Um, according to law, uh, tell us exactly what the law states as far as retrenchment is concerned. What is justified and what is not justified as far as retrenchment is concerned? And that's according to the law. Uh, normally, when it comes to employment, it's, 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 it's based on a contract between the employer and the employee. So the contractual obligations between the two parties need to be uh, followed to the full extent of the applicable laws in Kenya. The interesting bit is that um, given that our, our, our economy is actually mostly an informal aspect, you realize that our most contractual obligations are word of mouth mm -hmm. between the employer and the employee. So when things become thick, uh, the employer will simply say, you know, I've shut down the office, there's no work. And, and ultimately, there's nothing the employee can be able to do. But if there is a written contract that will stipulate how one will lose their job. For example, now, if, uh, if I'm employed by X, by X em employer, then that will mean that when they're terminating my, 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 my services, they'll have to follow the stipulated law. There are terms and, and conditions that will actually allow them to fire me. And in this case, assuming... Um, uh, given how the economy is, there's no business, then that will mean if I'm fired, I'm given one month severance pay and maybe my pension. And unfortunately, this, this is not being followed. Unfortunately, uh, given the, the, the financial situation most Kenyans are, uh, most of us are simply accepting our fate and, and trying to survive because you're trying to fight for something and, and, and to actually get legal redress will mean you need to have money and most of us don't have the money to actually even fight for, for our own rights. And this is why I was saying that I'm... Um, Federation of Kenya Employers and KOTU and CAM and KEPSA need to sit down together and actually analyze the, the, the correct data that's actually coming out from the labor market and see what is the best way forward. All right, let's take a look at the uh, employment crisis uh, further. Uh, Steve, even as we talk about retrenchment, and i um, really happy that you have actually mentioned some of the avenues that uh, Kenyans can use to get redress in case they feel they have been ill-treated by their employer. Um, I think the question here is just now about the Kenyan employment crisis. We know at least one million Kenyans, Steve, have lost their jobs or have been put on indefinite um, uh, halt uh, according to in terms of their services. Wasted companies, Steve, talk about tourism, transport, horticulture, communication and education. But when you look at the crisis right now, what would you say the impact is on the livelihoods of Kenyans? First and foremost, I think uh, it's more than a million Kenyans who've lost their jobs because, um, mm -hmm. as I've said, complete data is not yet out. So I think until at the end of the month, then you can be able to tell how the data will be looking like towards the end of the year. Mm -hmm. Secondly... So uh, we're saying that the, the one million might actually be more than I one million? I think it's more because um, what we're seeing is just the reported cases of formal employment. What about the informal sector? And this, this, is, this is a sector that doesn't really uh, mesh well with the media. So there's a lot of data that's actually not being reported. So the Kenya National Bureau of Statistics needs to actually release the correct data. And I think uh, we're only focusing on, on, on few sectors that, that have, have had the spotlight of the government. We're looking at uh, the hospitality, we're looking at tourism, we're looking at logistics, and we're looking at uh, the listed firms on the stock exchange. So for me, I think um, the impact of um, the retrenchment is going to actually be very critical and, and, and it's going to be a crisis because at the end of the day, we need to look at the numbers of how many Kenyans are unable to pay their rent, how many Kenyans are unable to buy food or at least even have two meals a day, how many Kenyans are unable to go to work, how many Kenyans are actually walking from uh, home to work, how many Kenyans have relocated from the urban centers to the rural centers because there is information that uh, many Kenyans are waiting for the, for, the, for the lockdown, for the cessation of movement in Nairobi to be lifted so they can relocate to the up country whereby it's easier to survive. So we are seeing uh, a crisis whereby people are living hand to mouth. We are seeing um, information coming from the health sector that hospitals are actually struggling to survive because people are not going are not going to hospitals. And I know uh, 
the, the health sector is actually critical at the moment, but if hospitals are reporting empty beds, that means it's a bigger problem. And if we're looking at the hospitality and entertainment sector, which is actually on a complete shutdown, and majority of Kenyans actually you know, uh, depend on entertainment and, and, and hospitality. So it's, it's, it's a critical crisis, and I think government is actually being... Um, uh, reluctant to actually release the correct information because it's also monitoring the situation and doing its best. But unfortunately, and unless all the parties come together and sit down and actually analyze, because we cannot be able to make the correct policy, we cannot be able to come up with the correct remedy if we do not have the correct information to be able to diagnose the problem and be able to see what is the best way forward. Steve, considering that we already had an employment crisis in the country, as far as especially the youth bracket is concerned, now we're seeing an even worse uh, situation in the country. You've mentioned this number might even be more than one million Kenyans. How does this impact on the growth of the economy of Kenya? Uh, Central Bank, uh, two weeks ago, alluded to the growth uh, for the rest of the year actually being at 2.3%. And for me, I think this is actually very ambitious because um, when you look at the macro aspect of the economy, the, the key sectors that actually drive the economy, you're looking at tourism, which is actually completely dead. Uh, because uh, travel Would you really say it's completely dead? Yeah, because one, there, there are no tourists coming in. I mean, the, the global economy is on a But how about local as far tourism? As, um, as far as... Uh, global tourism is actually concerned. Mm -hmm. uh, local tourism is dead because um, we cannot travel from here to Mombasa, we cannot travel from here to Naivasha. Uh, and if we're looking at local tourism in terms of uh, just Nairobi alone, many of us don't have the money to even go to the national parks. If you're looking at manufacturing, we look at the PMI of the manufacturing sector. It's actually dropped from 51% uh, towards the end of last quarter to 34% as of first quarter of this year. And I think this has dropped further. If we're looking at um, the transport and logistics sector, given the, 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 the amorphous uh, policy that are actually being made by the transport sector in terms of uh, movement of contain containers from Mombasa to Naivasha, uh, given the, the COVID and the cholera outbreak in the country. If you're looking at agriculture, we've been facing the issue of uh, locusts, uh, floods, uh, COVID. Uh, if you look at the, the issue of uh, access to credit, so all this are actually impacting the economy. And um, if nothing is done, we'll be looking at a recession. Because for me, I think the, the economy is actually growing at 1%, and this 1% is just basically recurrent expenditure by the government only. Other than that, no one else is investing, uh, no one else is making any moves, because everyone else is just waiting to see what is actually going to happen, or rather what's going to happen before they can be able to make a move. So in terms of growth, we'll, we're, we're staring at a recession unless something's happened. And, and, and this week is actually very important for Kenya and the rest of the East African countries, because we're looking at the budget allocations mm -hmm. to critical sectors of the economy to see whether we are focusing on post-COVID recovery, we're looking at um, jump-starting the economy, or we're just looking at paying salaries and, and being able to survive. And even talking about the budget allocation uh, that will be announced uh, on Thursday, Steve, I know you've mentioned quite some uh, critical sectors here. You've talked about transport sector, tourism sector, agriculture sector. And uh, looking at what to expect as far as the budget reading is concerned on Thursday, what areas do you think as a research analyst should be given prominence as far as budgetary allocation is concerned? Um, given, given what's happening from a global perspective and, and what was happening to the country before the COVID pandemic, I think for me key areas that need to be looked at is uh, first we need to ensure that our healthcare sector can be able to handle a surge in infections. And we've seen the Ministry of Health actually saying that um, focus needs to move to the counties so that they're actually well prepared to handle the rising cases of infections. Uh, so for me, one, healthcare is actually very important to ensure that um, the, our, our, our infrastructure can be able to handle surging infections. Two, we need to look at um, post-COVID recovery. And for me, the economy is actually very critical. So we're looking at agriculture. They need to be more focused on agriculture. They need to be more focused on the banking and in financial services sector because access to credit is actually going to be very important. Um, we need to look at security of, of the country and mostly internal security of the country. Uh, when you look at what's happening in the transport sector, for example, uh, with, with the... Um, Logistics, I mean, with the inter-East inter, inter African trade, there's a bigger problem there where we're seeing uh, truck drivers actually going on, start, I mean, complaining about what's been happening in terms of management of the COVID issue. So transport, uh, internal security, uh, agriculture, banking sector because of uh, access to credit, 
uh, manufacturing is actually very important because uh, three weeks ago, um, the country was actually running low on critical um, uh, products. And given the fact that our global trade has actually slowed down because of our restrictions on uh, travel, so we need to look at how we can be able to have local solutions to production. We need to look at, um, at the import-export balance and see how best can we really boost a local manufacturing, uh, mm -hmm. agro-processing. But looking at the budget estimates, I'm a bit disappointed with, with how the government of Kenya is actually looking because we've seen a Minister of Defence being allocated um, $115 billion. Uh, compared to Minister of Health uh, being given 111 billion. For me, I would think Minister of uh, Health will actually receive a, uh, a huge percentage of the budget estimates above anything else. And not to forget uh, what's going to happen in terms of education because currently uh, it's on a standstill and um, there are a lot of um, uh, research uh, modules actually being carried out to see when is the best time to actually reopen schools? If we to look at what's happening globally, uh, France, Singapore, uh, Taiwan, they did open the education system and shut them a week later. So also focus on that is actually going to be critical. But in terms of top five, I look at health. Number one, I look at um, agriculture. Number two, I look at uh, transport. Number three, then I look at internal security at number four. Then I'd, I mean. Um, tourism is actually very important and I think for now we need to forget about global tourism and focus on internal tourism, okay. domestic. And I'm talking about uh, pushing the country to look at the, the North Rift, pushing the country to look at the Western Circuit, pushing the country to look at other aspects be just beyond Naivasha and, mm -hmm. and, and Mombasa. You know, Steve, you alluded to my next question, talking about the previous budgetary allocations in the past. Uh, you've mentioned the issue of health, you've talked about security. Um, what do you feel about the government's priorities as far as budgetary allocation is concerned? What we have seen in previous uh, uh, budget reading and, you know, hopefully what will probably be improved in the coming budget reading? The, the budget estimates for this year, 2020-2021, uh, are 2.7. Uh, if we look at the previous uh, year, in 2019, 2020 was, I think, 3.3. So given what the global economy is going through, given what the local economy is going through, a uh, 2.7 trillion budget is actually very ambitious and very unrealistic. Because, um, one, care is going to have a very big problem collecting any taxes. If, if what's happening... Uh, on the listed listed firms have actually been issuing uh, profit warnings. Uh, we've seen a lot of uh, other top 100 SMEs listing. Uh, I mean, announcing uh, closure, announcing firing. So, in terms of a target set by carry, it's actually going to be very difficult to be able to meet the the, the, the budget alloc uh, estimates. Secondly, um, the economy is actually growing at one percent, and we're staring at a recession. So, I don't know how we are going to be able to meet these uh, budget estimates. Uh, three, um, for me, I think what the mm, National Treasury is just going to do is to collect money so that one, they pay salaries and two, pay debts. So anything else is actually going to be put on hold. So for me, I think um, the government is not being realistic. This is the time to be re realistic. I believe we've got very brilliant brains at uh, uh, National Treasury and I'm still waiting to see there the, are the explanations behind the estimates because I think they're too ambitious, they're too unrealistic, mm -hmm. uh, and I think uh, we are flogging a dead horse. You see, if the, if the informal sector has no access to credit, if the top, uh, say, 1,000 SMEs have, have got no access to credit, if, if support of um, the government COVID measures are only targeting selected sectors, then it's not going to be fair and it's going to be very difficult to survive. And I think um, once more data has come out and you've been able to analyze it, you'll realize that um, uh, the, 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 the nightmare of a recession is actually here. And we seem to realize that um, our focus of our politicians, parliament, the Senate uh, and the executive is actually focusing on political reforms instead mm -hmm. of an economic reform aspect. Well, Steve, uh, moving away from that, still on matters business, of course, what do you feel about the role of development finance institutions, especially in the wake of COVID-19? I think uh, the, Kenya is um, touted as um, the financial hub of the region. We're looking at East and, and, and Central Africa. Uh, this means that um, our financial sectors, our financial, uh, the, the banking and financial uh, sector is actually very critical to this. Uh, we've seen the Kenyan government borrow heavily 
from the commercial banks. So we know the critical role they play. And um, the unfortunate bit is um, the impetus as far as trying to come up with measures to mitigate the impact of the COVID a pandemic and also to come up with policy measures for post-COVID recovery have not really been felt. We've seen uh, banks uh, issue statements uh, on, on what they think should be done about the issue of, I know, ensuring that our pending bills are settled immediately to be able to ensure that there's liquidity in the economy. Other than that, nothing else has actually been felt from them. For me, I think, one, uh, there needs to be more collaboration between the banking sector, the financial sector, and I'm looking at banks, I'm looking at mobile money loans, I'm looking at uh, central bank, I'm looking at... Uh, Capital Markets Authority, I'm looking at the Insurance Reg Regulatory Authority, I'm looking at the Retirement Benefits, and especially on, on the Retirement Benefits Authority, we've seen uh, the pension sector coming actually under serious attack because now with, with the challenges the economy is facing, pensioners are actually not getting their pension on time. So there is more need to collaborate between the government and the, the financial sector, and especially the leading banking sector, because we've seen... Um, innovation from them that can actually be able to help the sector grow. Uh, we've seen the telecom sector actually also uh, play a key role in terms of innovating products and services that are actually seeing the growth of the, uh, the commercial and the banking sector. But lack of partnership, lack of honesty, lack of uh, transparency has seen um, a slow uh, collaboration in the sector. And this is a problem because uh, the informal sector is actually depending on this. The informal sector in the country, in East Africa, and in, in the larger aspect of um, Africa depend, depend on them. All right. Well, you know, uh, uh, Steve, even as we talk about the collaboration, uh, the issue of lockdowns, uh, the impact it has had on the supply chain, disrupting I the supply chains in the country, of course beyond, and also resulting in a tightening of consumer spending as a result. Um, if these lockdowns persist, what does this mean for the supply chains? First and foremost, I expected the president to actually be able to tell us the consequences of the last three months of, of a lockdown, whether it's worked or not, whether it's been uh, uh, good for the economy, bad for the economy, what are the numbers? Uh, secondly, I expected him to tell us that since he's added another 30 days in terms of um, locking critical aspects, because 60% uh, of the country's gross domestic product is actually in Nairobi. So when you shut down Nairobi, then you shut down Mombasa, you're shutting down at least 80% of the gross domestic product uh, aspect in terms of the economy. So we're looking at 20% of the economy is actually functional. So in terms of our consumer spending, in terms of production, in terms of local tourism, in terms of logistics, we are, we are at a standstill. Um, we, we, we are putting at risk a lot more if, we, if, if our decisions are not based on scientific research uh, data that's actually been analyzed. I expected Cambry, Ministry of Health, uh, other financial think tanks like um, the East African Institute of Finance to actually come out with more data explaining to us the ramifications of um, the current lockdown measures that we've had, the current um, curfew measures that we've had, because now, you know, we, we are back to basically working full time. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we're being told that um, our health care facilities are actually full, that are supposed to be taking care of the infections for the pandemic. Uh, we know the manufacturing sector has been um, functioning at its lowest ever. We know agriculture is actually on standstill because before the COVID, we had uh, the locust invasion, then we had floods. And floods actually did destroy almost everything. Uh, I'm a farmer, and I'm, I can tell you that um, our produce for this year has actually been destroyed. So we're not going to harvest anything, not to mention uh, the, 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 the COVID pandemic. Given the, the truck driver strike on the Malaba border coming all the way to, to Luandeti near Tarbo, uh, the, the, the possibility of a cholera outbreak. So it, 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 it's a soup, it's a hot mess in terms of um, what, is, what is the way forward. And for me, I think going forward, unless these measures are reviewed, and the president was very categorical, he did call for urgent meetings between relevant stakeholders by this week to be able to see what's going to happen in terms of opening up the air, local airspace, in terms of um, opening up local travel, in terms of uh, more, more, more measures opening up the hospitality, uh, mm -hmm. trying to see the, 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 the two billion 
relief fund for the hospitality sector and mm -hmm. unfortunately for me i expected parliament to be more to, to be in session, to be focusing and monitoring this situation on a day-to-day -day basis. But we see Parliament and the Senate uh, playing politics, uh, ignoring uh, the other fundamental aspects. Because right now the focus should be on the health aspect of Kenyan, of Kenyan people and the, and the economic situation. Well, you know, Steve, I, I, I want us to look further into uh, especially the impact that you know, lockdowns and the curfew has had on businesses. And when we return after this short break, Steve, I want us to go into the impact of the ease of the nationwide curfew. Of course, you've mentioned that business seems to be back to normal, but what does it mean for businesses and how can they take advantage of the new developments as far as the nationwide curfew is concerned? So right now, the Morning okay. Cafe will indeed take a short break. When we return, we take a look at that particular matter and, of course, understanding where to invest, especially during COVID-19. So don't go too far. The morning cafe will be back shortly. Welcome back. If you just joined us, this is the Morning Cafe. Today it's all about business, helping you understand 
all matters business and how, of course, you can invest right now and how you can help your business recover. And uh, today we are talking to Steve Biko, who is with us in studio. He is a research analyst. Steve, uh, before we took a break, we were talking about the lockdown, the curfew, and the impact it has had on businesses. But now we're talking about an ease on the nationwide curfew. What impact do you think this can have on businesses in the country? Um, the one thing I did appreciate about the president's uh, last address is um, he did talk about the, the, the measures to be taken in terms of easing um, the economy back into full throttle. And he did say that um, if we reduced uh, the, the current restrictions by, say, 20%, then he did give the indication of how many infections we'd have and how many deaths by the end of the year. So for me, I think um, we cannot just... I mean, we've been locked down since the fourth month. And we can just simply say, you know, now we need to ease up and, and, and go back to normal life. It, it, it's not going to work like that. Uh, COVID-19 is not, it's not a myth, it's a reality. And I think the problem with us Kenyans is unless something actually directly affects you, you don't, we don't really take it seriously. But I would like to tell Kenyans it's actually very serious. And uh, for me, I think um, I would like to support the president on... Um, on using a scientific approach in terms of um, easing back into normalcy. And I think what we knew about life, uh, how normal it was then, is not going to be normal anymore. We, we're going to adapt to a new normal. We're going to adapt to a new normal, but we constantly have to wash our hands, constantly have to wear masks, constantly have to social distance. Uh, handshakes, hugs are going to be probably a thing of the past until until when um, we can have either vaccine or a control over, 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 over the virus. But in terms of businesses, um, it's going to be challenging because um, uh, the issue of how the, the health guidelines that the Minister of Health is going to come up with in terms of ensuring that um, for us to open back, for example, let's say Marigiti Market or uh, Chole Market or um, uh, any other market food or Sokomjinga, for example, what are, the, what, are going to, what are the health guidelines that are going to be put in place to ensure that um, for this market to be open, then these are the things that are going to be put in. It's going to be very difficult because we know one of the key guidelines of social distance is going to be actually a big challenge. Uh, wearing masks, you know masks are not cheap. Uh, you can't wear one mask forever, so we have to keep changing them. Um, the issue of running water is a challenge. The issue of sanitizers is a challenge. So I think uh, before we can open the economy back, we need to address the availability of water, the availability of sanitizers and soap, the availability of uh, how we're going to ensure that our social distance guidelines are actually being met and being enforced, because um, we're going to see a spike in infections if this mm -hmm. is not done. And this is now the biggest headache that the government is facing in terms of opening back. But I'm just looking at the, the bottom of the pyramid in terms of the economy. Uh, when you're looking at middle class and upper class, uh, enforcing this is actually going to, can be easier because there'll be availability of resources. And you've seen... Um, with the change of curfew hours from uh, uh, 7 p.m. to 9 p.m., we've seen people now, you know, working full time, 8 to 5. And the challenge now is, are we wearing masks? Are we washing our hands? Are we sanitizing our hands? And this is a challenge. Because for me, I think before any business, whether it's in the informal sector or it's a listed farm on the stock exchange, can reopen, I think we need to use scientific data that's that's supposed to be released by Minister of Health, courtesy of Kemri. And this is something that I would urge the government to actually focus on. Be able to give us the numbers, be able to let, tell us what is happening. I know there's a challenge in terms of uh, testing and sustaining the number of testing. Uh, we were maintaining a number of 3,000 per day. Yesterday, uh, the numbers coming out were 1,090. This is actually a significant drop. And uh, one of the reasons given is that um, there's, there's, there's low supply of the reagents uh, in terms of testing. So we are facing a lot of challenges in terms of um, managing the pandemic, in terms of managing the information that is coming out. Steve, you know, when you look at what the government is doing, of course, we've been on a lockdown in some of the counties. We, we're talking about a nationwide curfew. Uh, perhaps, do you think maybe the government is just trying to ease off the current status gradually so that also uh, the current, uh, you know, curfew and lockdown does not end up crippling the economy further? I think uh, what the government is trying to do is, um, first and foremost, let's admit that uh, managing the pandemic has been very difficult. And uh, depending on which political side you are on, you'll be able to look at um, 
how the president has been able to manage. For me, I think uh, there's more that should have been done. There's more that can be done. And I think what the government is going to do is basically not overwhelm the healthcare system, nothing mm -hmm. else. And two, uh, I think they're trying to see if the communities, uh, we look at the counties, now we have 30 counties that have uh, been able to report cases of COVID. So I think the government is trying to see if we can, we can use what you call uh, what the doctors are saying had had immunity whereby uh, you lock down people in, in a particular community, let them interact, let them be together, they build up immunity to the virus. And I think that's what the government trying to do so that we do not overwhelm the healthcare system. Because when you look at the numbers of preparedness across the counties, it's actually very disappointing. Uh, there's been a, a fight between the, the devolution um, uh, administrative units versus the national government in terms of uh, release of funds to create preparedness. We look at, uh, for example, counties like Siaya, counties like Bungoma, counties like Kisumu, in terms of how many beds for isolation for COVID they have. It's actually very disappointing. Busia has uh, 30 beds. They're all full. We've, been, we've reported over 200 cases from Busia. So where are these cases going to? We've seen people actually being held, who are sick, being held at, um, at testing centers. So it's actually... Uh, imperative that um, the government does more and I think what the Ministry of Health and Ministry of uh, Interior and Coordination are doing is to be able to implement measures that will not be able to cripple the healthcare system and this is actually where the, the key focus is. Listening to you it feels like you do not believe that the easing off of the nationwide curfew is towards helping businesses you know try and you know get away to recover because for some they feel this might be an attempt by the government to try and resuscitate the economy isn't this the case steve uh for me uh, i don't think there's anything that's being done to help uh the informal sector get back to business because uh three weeks ago key hotels in this country actually fired more than 3,000 people. There was a huge cry on social media platforms. We saw the government writing to them and asking for an explanation. Two weeks later, we see the president pledging $2 billion in terms of support. But what about the informal sector that actually employs 80% of the country's population? Who's going to support them? Yeah, if we've been forced to stay at home for three months, your business has been shut down, your landlord has kicked you out, you've moved three houses, you're actually relocating from an urban center to a rural aspect, and there's no access to credit. There are you know, carriers in your case demanding for you to pay taxes. From what money? You know? So I don't think the government is actually doing enough to ensure that uh, we get back to our feet. I don't think the, the government is doing enough to ensure that um, the key aspect of the economy, agriculture, uh, the informal sector, the SME aspect, they have access to credit. For me, the only thing that the government is focusing on is to ensure that the healthcare system is not overwhelmed. Because the moment we overwhelm the healthcare system, then you're going to cripple the country. And a sick nation is not a good, a good, a, a good indication on this government. But the unfortunate bit is a lot of more resources are actually being driven towards politics instead of towards business. I, I've not seen... Um, the Kenya Bankers Association actually coming together and saying, now you know what, we've created a guarantee bank for the critical number of SMEs to be able to access this money, to be able to reopen. You see, the hospitality sector is actually important, but it's not the only sector that actually manages this country. Yeah, right. We're looking at agriculture, we're looking at the services sector, we're looking at the transport sector. If you, mm -hmm. if you take a walk around Nairobi, most people who do logistics, courier services, they've shut down. Their buses, their trucks, their lorries, they're just at, I know, you know, at, at the backing spot waiting for the country to reopen. And the unfortunate bit is that we're all afraid. As, as, as we ease measures to go back to normalcy, we see infections spiking up. And we see, we're being told, all oh, the key uh, management centers, Kenyatta University Hospital, uh, Kenyatta Hospital, uh, Nairobi Hospital, Aga Khan Hospital, Bagathi Hospital, they're all actually full in terms of isolation, in terms of management of the virus. So what next? So there's a lot that needs to be done. Uh, there's a lot more but, information that needs to be channeled okay. out. Well, Steve, uh, given what you've said, but uh, shedding some bit of hope and light in relation to the easing of the nationwide curfew, do you think there's something businesses or entrepreneurs can do right now 
uh, to somewhat try and recover the losses, especially uh, maybe capitalizing on the easing of the nationwide curfew? Is there a possibility that this can happen? I, I'm not pessimistic. I, I think Kenyans are a resilient lot, and um, there's a lot that's actually being done. We've seen the private sector actually coming out to do a lot more in terms of supporting um, the less vulnerable. We've seen the Indian community. We've seen KEPSA come coming together. We've seen a lot of support being given to Red Cross. And um, I know um, one, the f from the last address of the president, I know we are back to, to normal business operations. Business are opening. Uh, yesterday I took a tour around Nairobi to, to see just what's happening around in terms of business. I, I see Marigiti is trying to clean up from if we get the market. We've seen um, op uh, business parks, business uh, office suits opening up. Uh, we've seen um, key, key, key hotels that actually fired people. Uh, recalling the people back and saying, you know what, back to normalcy. We've seen restaurants trying to reopen. Uh, we've seen uh, transport uh, managers actually saying that uh, they're trying to see what they can be able to do. So there is, there is a back to business. The challenge is, as I, I've said over, uh, over and above, is access to credit. And what the government can do for us is come bring together the banking sector and the financial sector and see what fund they can be able to create for us to be able to access so we can get back to, to, to normal business because having closed business for more than three months and then you reopen back, you're trying to see how many employees do you need, how many employees do you need, do you need to let go and also I think um, Karen needs to be able to be a bit more understanding. I know the, 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 the role is statutory and is set in law but um, they need to understand that we've been on a standstill for three months, so they need to also be able to understand the, the nature of how the economy is uh, rolling back. You know, it's, it's like a car. When your car's been idle for three months, when you try and restart it, you're looking at how much oil it is, whether the oil has um, become fermented or not, mm -hmm. uh, whether the fuel lines are, are okay or they need to be cleaned. Uh, you need to look at whether the brakes are functioning or not. So there's a lot more. To be done and also we need to look at what other countries are doing we we've seen south africa had measures of uh, restrictions from uh, level five to level four to level three uh, that is something that i didn't see in kenya uh we've seen what italy is doing they had a very worst case scenario but they're also easing back into operations uh, countries like uh, the swiss never really closed down but given how the global economy is performing, uh, most countries are going to recession. Most countries are actually are trying to see how economy, I mean, key companies can actually have access to credit so that they don't shut down. We've seen um, many companies, listed firms in the country, issuing profit warnings. And this is something that um, we need to look at. Uh, we need to look at companies like um, Mumias that are not trading anymore in the stock market. KQ have been uh, seeking support to bail out from the government. So we also need to look at how best we can be able to look at the key aspects of the economy that are actually imperative to move. Because if agriculture is not moving, if manufacturing is not moving, then dependent sectors like transport and service and security will not be able to function. So the government needs to look at um, what are the core aspects, tier one aspect of the economy that needs to move fast before tier two, tier three three can be able to be supported. All right. Well, let's move away from the nationwide curfew, Steve, and, and move on to uh, investing during COVID-19. We know that some businesses have closed because they're not able to finance their expenses. And uh, we know people have lost jobs, some are at home trying to figure out what next. So is there a possibility that there are places or certain businesses one can invest in during COVID-19 that can be, well, you could say hopefully lucrative for them? Uh, well, great wealth is made during a crisis. And uh, if, if, if anyone had money, this is the perfect time to invest. There are a lot of opportunities to invest across the economy. Uh, the, the stock market presents the easiest low-hanging fruits in terms of investment. Um, there are good listed firms that are, one can actually be able to invest in. We're looking at Safaricom, we're looking at the financial sector, we're looking at the listed firms from banking sector, we're looking at manufacturing, we're looking at um, construction. Uh, other sectors that actually present opportunities for investment is logistics, courier services, uh, uh, agriculture, agro-processing. I think COVID has actually been able to, you know what you call an acid test to an economy. Uh, for, for the longest time, we've been an import country. And given the lockdown in terms of trans, uh, air travel, many Kenyan, many Kenyan businesses, Kenya business 
people and entrepreneurs have not been able to travel. So this has actually made us look inward. How do we produce our own products to be able to sell locally? So there are a lot of uh, opportunities. Manufacturing sectors present a lot of opportunities. Agricultural sector value add. You know, we export a lot of raw materials to import back to import back our finished products. So I think going forward, we need to see how, how best we can be able to do value, value addition. Who knew we could be able to produce masks in Kitui? <laughs> Who knew we can be able to d develop and manufacture ventilators in the country? So there are a lot of uh, opportunities and a lot of hanging fruits. The only challenge that we have as a country is uh, access to credit. And I think this is something that the, um, I would like to add advisors to the president to be able to look at. If we can only be able to sort out how we can be able to access credit, m uh, give us tax incentives and, and, and ta tax breaks, then I think... Um, we can we can we can do what you call an industrial revolution that actually has been in the offing for the longest time. You know, we, you cannot talk about buy Africa, build Africa, or buy Kenya, build Kenya, if we don't focus on manufacturing and agriculture. And there are a lot of opportunities there. And you know, looking at the impact of COVID-19, just last week I was talking to an analyst, Steve, and he talked about uh, uh, the agricultural sector, the manufacturing sector have been greatly affected. So how then can someone invest there right now considering the impediments that are facing the sectors one um, there are two great challenge, three great, great challenges that the, the agricultural sector has been facing one farmers have not had access to credit two the the low cost invasion that has not been able to be sold and then three floods out of these three right now we're, we're staring at a food security aspect um, uh, the agriculture and agro processing sector co correlate to the retail aspect if you go to a supermarket, if you go to a mamboga, you, you realize that the, the price of basic commodities has actually gone up because the produce are actually becoming less and less and less. Now that floods are over, now that um, rains have normalized, then it's actually a perfect opportunity for someone to get back into farming. Onions, tomatoes, uh, grain, uh, sugar, uh, greens. It's actually a good opportunity for now. And I think what someone needs to do is look at a... a irrigated kind of farming. Second, uh, those who have access to capital and can be able to loan farmers to be able to do this. So access to credit. So we're looking at if the financial sector can actually be able to come up with financial products that target farmers will actually be very important. Uh, right now, we, we, we pride ourselves as having been you know, a country that actually looks at innovative products. We can have financial, mobile financial products that target farmers. It's actually very important. I have a, I have a friend who's a, a big farmer in, in Western Kenya who's looking at over 200,000 acres of maize and sugarcane. And his biggest challenge has been access to credit. But if he can be able to get access to credit, to be able to pay the daily wages to his people, to his workers, then it can actually be important. So for me, I think um, uh, there's blood in the market, there's blood on the streets, and when there's blood on the streets, it's actually a great opportunity for people to be able to invest. Well, Steve, we have a question here on Twitter from uh, an account here calling itself Soko Analyst. And the question here is, Ministry of Defense has been allocated $115 uh, Four billion more than the Mi Ministry of Health as government of Kenya unveils a 2.7 trillion unrealistic budget, according to this gentleman. So the question for him uh, to you is, what do you think is the way forward? I, I think, and I mentioned it, I, I think I said focus for this budget should have been on, on, on two issues. One, how do you prop up the healthcare so that it doesn't suffer a, a cripple because of the surge in infections? And two, post-COVID recovery of focusing on agriculture, manufacturing, and local tourism, and access to credit for SMEs. Those five issues should be top five in terms of this budget. But when you're giving Ministry of Defense more money than Ministry of Health, I mean, honestly, uh, the, 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 the COVID virus is not an external enemy. It's an internal enemy. It's an enemy that cannot be fought by guns and, and airships and things like that. So I think for now, we need to redirect our resources to what is more critical. But I'm, 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 I'm waiting for Parliament, who are our representatives, to be able to see what they'll be able to, to do. I had one of the members of Parliament talking about saying that this is a very ambitious um, budget estimate and they're waiting for Parliament on Thursday to be able to debate it and see how they can both handle it. All right. Thank you so much, Steve Biko, for making my, my time pleasure. for us. Uh, Steve Biko, research analyst. Uh, we appreciate your thoughts and your wealth of knowledge towards today's discussion. Thank you for making time. Thank you very much.
And well, that has been a look at the world of business uh, with uh, research analysts.